slides, so wait till then. Anyway, so I'll try and get this done as fast as possible. I know you guys want lunch, so do I. So, <laughs> um, so my topics today will be menstruation, endometriosis, fibroids, menopause, prolapse, and uogyne. Um, I kind of got all the leftover topics, so there won't really be much to, I guess, mesh them all together, but anyway. Um, so menstruation, I'll go through the menstrual cycle, forms the basis of most of your gynae conditions. So it would be really, really good if you guys could learn this backwards, forwards, inside out, back to front. It's really important. So going through the hormones first. So you've got your GnRH um, from your hypothalamus. This is released in a pulsatile fashion and the frequency of the pulses depends um, which other hormone is um, released on the pituitary. So slow pulses, you're going to get more of your FSH. Fast pulses, you're going to have more of your LH being released. So then moving down to your pituitary, you've got your FSH, so your follicle stimulating hormone, basically does what it says. And it also um, stimulates estrogen production. In terms of LH, um, it stimulates production of the progesterone from the follicle that's made. So really don't have much to do with the LH until you've got your surge and you've got your follicle developing. In terms of estrogen, um, this is released from your theca interna and it changes the speech of the GnRH. So it's got the negative feedback back up to the hypothalamus, hypothalamus and depend, dependent on the concentration of estrogen dictates what the hypothalamus would do. Um, and then you've got your progesterone, which basically just maintains the endometrium and maintains pregnancy later on. So this is your graph that everyone loves. Learn it. Um, I know everyone will probably say that to you, but it is really, really important. Um, I, think, I guess the main things to note is your LH surge happens after your estrogen surge. Um, and then your estrogen is um, less than your progesterone during the luteal phase um, where the corpus luteum is around. Um, and that the dying of progesterone causes you to menstruate. I think that's the main things that you need to know, but it is really, really important. Any questions about that before we move on to actual conditions and stuff? Cool. So endometriosis, this is your main diagnosis for painful periods, um, apart from, you know, normal menstrual pain. Um, so, terms of overview of endometriosis. So it's the presence of endometrial tissue. So your tissue in the uterus outside of the uterus. So, and this can be anywhere. Um, I've seen it in the lungs. I've seen it in the heart. Um, it can be literally anywhere in your body. Um, the most common places obviously are going to be your pelvic sidewall, in your abdomen, um, in the pouch of Douglas. Those are your most common places, but just be aware that it can be anywhere. Um, it's estimated in Australia, we've got a one in 10 incidence. However, this is, we think, an under um, estimate of what the real incidence is, um, as not everyone with endometriosis will get a diagnosis or get a lap um, to diagnose it. Um, in terms of pathophysiology, um, don't really know why some people get endometriosis and some people don't. We do know that retrograde menstruation is important. Um, however, people without endometriosis will have retrograde menstruation and they don't get this um, development of these lesions in their pelvis. So we don't know um, why some people do and some people don't. Um, and basically the reason that it causes pain is because during the menstrual cycle, when the um, endometrium in the uterus is growing, the endometrial tissue that's causing the endometriosis is also growing and then it also sheds. And that's what causes the pain in most people. Um, so just a side note, adenomyosis is different to endometriosis and you can have either one together or um, separately. And adenomyosis is the endometrial tissue inside the myometrium, which also causes a lot of pain. So commonly they will come um, and say that they've got very, very painful periods, disabling um, generally a cyclical pain. Um, however, they can have mid-cycle pain and they also develop chronic pain um, syndrome. So they have like constant pelvic pain. 
Um, some people can have painful defecation because they've got endometrial lesions on their bowel, on their victim, and that's causing them pain whenever they go to the toilet. Um, it can also be a cause of infertility, and some people don't find out they have endometriosis until they can't, be, can't fall pregnant. Um, like I said, chronic pelvic pain and deep dyspnea when they have sex because they can have lesions on their vagina wall, on the back of the vagina wall, or um, on the cervix as well. So in terms of examination, um, you're not really going to get much findings unless the endometrial lesion is quite big. Um, sometimes you can feel it in the posterior vaginal fornix. Um, another thing is that they might have a fixed uterus. So because of all the endometrial tissue in the pelvis, the uterus gets lots of adhesions and therefore you can't um, palpate the uterus um, because it won't move. Um, in terms of diagnosing endometriosis, you've got your gold standard lap, but obviously not everyone's going to get a lap, so you need other ways to find it. Um, vaginal and trans, transvaginal pel um, pelvic ultrasound is getting more and more used as a diagnostic tool um, because people are getting more and more trained in how to do this and how to spot the lesions um, under ultrasound. However, it's not something that every radiological center will do. It's only a specific, um, like a very specialized test. Um, you can do an MRI, but really um, people only do this when they need to plan for um, rectal excision and surgery. Um, so if your lady that you have in your OSCE um, has what you think might be a rectal mass and a rectal um, lesion, you send them from an MRI before you say, um, we're going to go straight to surgery. You also need to get your, um, colonoscopy, um, your colorectal surgeons involved in those cases as well. Um, in terms of treatment, so um, basic treatment will be your hormone control. So you put them on the contraceptive pill, you can put, uh, give them a Mirena um, after you take out all the lesions. Um, but your last line hormone, um, not contraceptive, hormone treatment will be Zolodex. Um, so Zolodex, I don't know if anyone else has talked to you about it today, um, but what it is is basically induces menopause. Um, so when you are in menopause, you don't get pain because you don't have adhesion, it doesn't grow, and it just kind of sits there. Um, however, this isn't a quick fix. Um, this we do for our patients when it's you know, they might have to wait a few months for their surgery and they just can't deal with the pain any longer um, and you put them on Zolodex, they go through menopause, um, they have the surgery, take them off the Zolodex and then they go back to being a normal, um, however old they are, person. Um, another thing with the Zolodex is they can only be on it for three months and then you have to take them off. So you really have to be sure that they're going to get their surgery in the next three months if you want to put them on it. Um, obviously, the gold standard treatment is excision of the endometriosis. However, as you guys probably know, it can come back um, and it does often come back. Um, bowel resection, like I said, if you've got a lesion on the bowel um, and you can do a bilateral oophorectomy, self-injectomy, if um, they're you know, done having kids and they just want their endometriosis to be um, taken care of. Um, however, we do know that if we do take away the ovaries, um, they can still get um, some pain. We're not really sure why they still get the pain, um, but um, it is possible. So it's not a, there's no, I guess, one excellent thing to do um, to get rid of endometriosis. Um, this is what it will look like in your laps. So most of the time it'll look like this, but um, can also appear in other ways. So this is your classic chocolate cyst endometrioma. So endometrioma is just endometriosis of the ovary. Um, pelvic adhesions and um, making the pelvis look bizarre and not right. Um, and you've got a bit of bowel endometriosis just there. Any questions about endometriosis before we move on? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so you put a myrena in after you've moved the lesions because um, the myrena is supposed to stop periods. 
So if you stop the periods and you've got no lesions in your pelvis, then in theory, there should be no more retrograde menstruation for it to escape from the uterus. So if you, but if you still have lesions and you put a myrena in, um, the ovaries still produce a little bit of estrogen. So they'll still get a little bit of pain. So the best way to stop them from having any pain is to get it rid of it and then put a myrena in. No, I've rarely seen it um, done that way. All right, so moving on to fibroids. These cause heavy periods. Um, other things that you might hear are leomyoma or fibroma. They're all the same things. They're all fibroids. So um, these are benign tumors of the myometrium. Um, they hardly ever will progress to malignant disease. 20% um, of all women will have a fibroid at some point in their life, which I think is a staggering number. Um, and in terms of pathophys, basically um, stimulated by estrogen, again, we have no idea why some people get it and why some people don't. Um, so these are the different places that you can have a fibroid. Um, so you've got the ones that are in the cavity, in the submucosal space, in the subserosal space, intramural, and you've got the pedunculated ones. Um, but any of them can be, be pedunculated um, if they're on the inside or the outside. So common presentations, like I said, they'll have very heavy periods. Um, they might get um, prolonged spotting throughout every day, or um, they'll have like a really short bit of really, really heavy, and then they'll have spotting either side. Um, fullness of pressure in the abdomen is also a very common presentation. So though someone will come in and just say, I feel like I have this pressure in my tummy and I'm not sure what it's from. I thought I was just bloated, but it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger um, or more pressure. Um, sometimes they can have frequency, um, nocturia or retention if the fibroid is um, interrupting with their um, urogen urogenitory system. Um, and they can also be um, can also be a reason for infertility or recurrent miscarriages. In terms of examination, you'll probably have a palpable uterus. Um, a lot of the time, when you're examining these patients, you'll say, you know, the uterus is 20 weeks gestation. They don't actually have a baby, but it's that big. Um, and on bimanual, you'll feel mass. Um, so. Diagnosis can be done by a pelvic ultrasound. Um, they're very good at seeing these kind of masses. And management, basically, if they don't want surgery, you can treat the heavy bleeding by giving them transexamic acid, imirena, or again, the Zolodex. Um, but I guess main management will be a surgery to remove the fibroid. So you can do a myomectomy um, for the intramural and the subserosal ones, and those are your most common two types of fibroid. Um, you can resect it out if it's submucosal or if it's intraluminal, um, or you can do a hysterectomy as well. Um, and, but hysterectomies are only done by current fibroids. Um, we don't really like taking out the uterus. Um, so just fibroids in pregnancy, I just thought I'd add a side note, although I'm not very well OBS inclined. Um, it, fibroids can lead to complications in pregnancy, such as ischemia and necrosis, causing lots of pain. Um, basically, because of the um, lots of estrogen and progesterone in the system, your fibroid grows and grows along with your baby. And then because it grows so fast, the um, vascular supply doesn't grow with it. So there starts to be a necrotic um, tissue and necrotic areas. Um, and this, it can cause lots of pain and issues. In terms of um, labor, it can obviously obstruct labor if you don't know where it is and you didn't really know about it before you got pregnant. Um, and it can um, be a atonic cause of postpartum hemorrhage because, um, because of the fibroid being there, the uterus doesn't contract very well and they can continue to hemorrhage. Any questions about that one? Cool. So menopause. They have no periods. Um, so menopause, it's really important to get your terminology right. Um, 
so this is probably drummed into you a million, million, million times, but perimenopause is a time of menstrual irregularity until menopause. Um, so, you know, someone hasn't had a period for two months and they get one, six months and they get one. They're not in menopause, they're in perimenopause. Perimenopause is a specific point in time. So this point in time is um, 12 months from their last period. And then you can say uh, they're menopausal and they will, in theory, not have periods after this. If they do, investigate it. Um, and then postmenopause is more than 12 months after the last menopausal, last known period. Um, so average age of onset is 20, uh, 51 years old. Um, normal is 45 to 55 years old. Um, anything outside of this would be considered abnormal. We don't really mind if you're a bit older and you go through menopause a bit later, although it does increase the risk of a number of the cancers but um, it's when they go through menopause a bit younger that we don't particularly like it for their bones and their heart health. Um, it's, we, I guess, treat it a bit more then. So premature menopause is less than 40. Um, early onset menopause is between 40 and 45 years old. So in terms of hormone changes, when you go through menopause, if we take um, here-ish as when this um, is menopause. Um, basically everything decreases. Um, the one thing of note is that your FSH ends up to be more than any of your other hormones um, and you will have some estrogen still, um, mainly from your fat cells um, being produced. Uh, common presentations. Um, so a lot of people go to their GP with these problems. So they'll have irregular cycles, some spotting. Um, they can have central um, symptoms, so hot flushes and um, a few memory issues, depression um, and insomnia. Um, urogenital atrophy. So they'll have um, pain on sex, vaginal dryness. It'll be very uncomfortable for them. Um, some metabolic and cardiovascular things, um, they can develop diabetes, develop high blood pressure. Um, their cholesterol will go up as well um, and they will experience some weight gain mainly around the belly area. Um, and they also may present with a osteopenic fracture um, or a, like brittle bones, things like that. Uh, in terms of management, you've got your non-hormonal stuff. So in your OSCEs, this is where you start and this is what you want to spend most of your time on because examiners love it when you can suggest something that's not pills and things like that. So hot flushes. So tell them to wear many layers so they can take them off when they have a hot flush. Um, they can put a fan by the bedside at night. Um, you want to avoid certain triggers, so things like alcohol, spicy foods, and caffeine can set off hot flushes. So good to make sure that you are mentioning those as well. Um, in terms of medications just for hot flushes, you can use some of your SSRIs, gabapentin and clonidine. Um, so um, if they just have hot flushes, these won't help with any of the other things like bone health and things like that. So vaginal dryness, so things like cotton underwear, um, avoiding soaps that are scented, um, and you, you can use like moisturizer or lubricant when you have sex um, just to make it a bit, I guess, more pleasant. Um, but the main thing is tropical estrogen for vaginal dryness. Um, osteoporosis, um, you know, making sure that they're getting the um, correct amount of calcium and vitamin D each day is really important because that'll be the mainstay of management for osteoporosis. Um, you can also get them to exercise and do things like that. That's good for their bones. Um, metabolic um, issues such as weight, um, such as like putting on weight and things like that. So obviously the opposite, get them to lose a weight, um, healthy diet and smoking sensation can really, really help with some of these symptoms as well. So your hormone replacement therapy, um, basically I tried to put this really, really simply, um, but it can get a bit complicated. 
So everyone needs estrogen. <laughs> they get a low dose continual, continuous estrogen administration. This can be either through a pill or it can be a patch. So everyone needs estrogen if you want to put them on hormone replacement therapy. If they have endometrial tissue, so that is a uterus, if they still have a uterus or if they have endometriosis, then they also need progesterone. So this can either be done, again, oral, implanon, or myrena. And then we've got things if they're perimenopausal and postmenopausal. So if they're perimenopausal, i.e. they haven't had 12 months since their last period, they need to have cyclical hormone replacement therapy. So that's 14 days of estrogen, then 14 days of both of the two, estrogen and progesterone. They can also have a withdrawal bleed if they so wish, um, and that is every three months we recommend it, unless, of course, they have the influenon or myrena. We can't really take away their estrogen, I mean, their progesterone, to, to let them have a withdrawal bleed. Yeah? So my understanding for, from it is that we do cyclical because we want to try and keep them in the same cycle as they were before um, all the changes happened. Um, we do continuous afterwards because when they're on the cyclical, they can still get some symptoms, um, and, but the symptoms should be less and less often, um, whereas continuous HRT, they shouldn't have any symptoms at all. In terms of postmenopausal, um, yep, yeah, so you just have continuous HRT, so continuous estrogen and progesterone. Yeah? Um, no, not necessarily. So a lot of the people in perimenopause will also need birth control of some sort. So the myrena and the implanon is really, really good for that. Um, and they, they don't need to have withdrawal bleeds. It's just um, sometimes suggested. So um, if they are on a myrena or an implanon for contraceptive um, you know, um, reasons, then it's fine for them to be on that continuous kind of regime. Um, so then comes age into the equation of um, HRT. So if they're less than 50 years, like I said, they will need some sort of contraception because technically they're still able to become pregnant. So either barrier contraception, the combined oral contraceptive pill, marina or implanon are really good options in this case. Um, if they're over 50 years, they need contraception for one year since their last um, period. So if they are postmenopausal, then they don't need contraception. But if they are perimenopausal, they do need contraception. So it can either be barrier, myrena or implanon. In terms of stopping the hormone replacement therapy, because obviously it's not good to be on this stuff for a long period of time, um, you need to get them to be reviewed every two years. And at these two year points, you should um, ask them, you know, how are you going? How are you feeling about it? Do you mind coming off? It is a very good thing if you are going to start HRT to tell them that this is not a lifelong, um, this is not a lifelong fix, and your symptoms should go away after a few years. We're going to see if you can come off it in a few years' time. Um, always like tell that to them when you're starting that, um, starting them on HRT because some women will come back to you and say like, "Oh, it's great, I'm going to keep going," and you're like, "No, no, you're not." <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. So no, <laughs> if you're on the pill, then you're just on the pill and that's your HRT. Um, but yeah, yeah, it can. But HRT, um, the, the levels of progesterone and estrogen are generally less than the oral contraceptive pill. Um, and sometimes it's not appropriate for people to be on the, um, on the pill because, you know, they've got risk of DDTs and things like that. So we're happy for them, those kind of people to be on HRT, but not on the pill. Um, yeah. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so I've got a question about 
that's kind of where it differs. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, so at five years after starting treatment, the benefit for the treatment being bone health and things like that um, equals the risk of breast cancer and thromboembolism. So at five years, you really need to sit them down and talk to them about um, if they're going to continue, if they're still on it. Um, and then when they're at over 10 years, really the risk outweighs the benefit and they really shouldn't be on it anymore. Their risk for breast cancer, like doubles, I think. Um, and their risk of thromboembolism is very, very high. So if you have a lady who's on HRT for 10 years or more, um, you've really got to sit them down and say, look, you're probably going to die from something else if I keep you on this. Um, there is this wonder drug called Tibolone. Well, we thought it was a wonder drug. It's not. Um, these, this is only for those who are at increased risk of breast cancer. So people with BRCA1 mutations, people with breast cancer in their immediate family, things like that. Um, those are the people that Tibolone can be used for. Um, it's not as good as the other HRT for symptoms, um, especially um, cardiovascular health and bone health. So benefits of HRT. Um, so your cardiovascular health basically decreases the risk um, if it's less than six years. Um, and basically your lipid profile, your insulin resistance, your blood pressure and your weight gain will be all less um, if you're on the H HRT. Um, your bone health is better because you have less risk of osteoporosis. Yeah. Yes. So it only increases your risk of thromboembolism after five years. Yeah. Um, except if you have had a previous thromboembolism, then your risk is um, high, but sometimes you can still argue that it, it'll be fine. Um, and HRT will also decrease the risk of some of your cancers. So endometrial, ovarian, colorectal cancers um, decreases the risk. In terms of um, relative contraindications, um, why people shouldn't be on HRT. So things like being obese, having a past medical history um, of cardiovascular events, um, having a bad lipid profile already, insulin resistance, diet and lifestyle should all be um, concerning and um, think of twice about prescribing HRT. Um, so yeah, like I said, if they already have an increased risk of thromboembolism, increased risk of rupture or of existing atherosclerotic plaques if they have an increased risk of thromboembolism or reasons to think twice. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't have HRT, just think twice about it. Um, things like, um, and like I said, breast cancer, if they've got a past history or family history of breast cancer, um, tibolone is probably better than um, the normal conventional HRTs. Questions about HRT? Yeah. Yeah, so if you can get them to smoke, um, stop smoking rather, um, <laughs> get them to smoke. No, get them to stop smoking is better, um, but the progesterone um, and the estrogen in HRT is less um, than, you know, your old contraceptive pill. So for the people who smoke, I wouldn't put them on the OCP, but I would put them on maybe um, some low-dose estrogen, low-dose progesterone, um, and they should be okay. But obviously getting them to cut down and things like that will be better because it also exacerbates their symptoms. So um, before you even start them on OCP, um, you should be, um, or HRT, you should be getting them to stop smoking in your initial, you know, lifestyle management section um, before putting them on. All right, prolapse, let's change gear all together. Um, so, Prolapse. We've got different types of prolapse. Um, so you've got your uterocervical prolapse, so your cervix and uterus, rectocele, rectum, cystocele, the bladder, and intercele, Patrick Douglas. So your cystocele is the most commonest cause of prolapse, um, and it is the most annoying cause as well. Um, and also that epidemiology is frightful. Um, so 41% of women between the ages of 50 and 79 will have some sort of prolapse. 
So in terms of your anatomy, let me orientate you to this photo because it took me a while. Um, basically, this is your pubic synthesis here, urethra, vagina, rectum at the back. So front is that way. Um, so you've got your three levels of support for your um, pelvic organs. You've got your level one support, so your uterosacral ligaments. Basically, this just supports the uterus and the cervix and keeps it in place. Your level two support, you've got your endopelvic fascia. So um, it is here and it supports that way, like to the sides. Um, and basically this supports the cervix, the mid portion of the vagina, the bladder and the bowel. Your level three um, support is your pelvic floor and your perineal body. So it supports all your pelvic structures um, and include the important superficial transverse perineal muscle and pubovectalis. They love asking questions about this in your via, especially because it does cover your year one and two stuff as well as, as um, women's stuff. So I know it sucks, but remember your pelvic floor. So your common presentations um, for prolapse, generally they'll feel a pressure or lump in their vagina and they'll say it's really uncomfortable. Um, it feels funny. Um, if they have a cystocele, they'll come in with your urinary symptoms. So urinary tension and obstruction, straining or weak stream. It's kind of like your um, benign prostatic, prostatic hypertrophy um, symptoms, but, um, but in a woman. So yeah, so incomplete emptying, overflow incontinence and recurrent UTIs as well. In terms of uterocervical um, prolapse, um, they might have a bit of discomfort when they have sex. And rectocele, they'll have um, trouble emptying their bowels, um, have to go multiple times a day, feel like they haven't finished, things like that. In terms of your examination, um, basically you get them to, you have a look at it and see, oh, what can I see? And then you get them to do a Valsalva and see if it descends any further. You then put them, push everything back up and see if it will come down by itself get them to cough, um, and then you do this pop Q assessment, which you guys do not need to know. It is something that the gynees will do. Um, I just thought I'd show you an example here because when I was you guys and I was going to all these clinics, I was like, what the hell is that and what are they looking at? Um, so basically they've got these nine, um, nine different things that they look at, at what's descending and things like that and where, how far they've descended. Um, and that's where they get their um, numbers from. Negative means above the hymen um, and positive means below the hymen. Um, and a dash means it hasn't moved from where the hymen is. Uh, in terms of management, so talk to your pregnant ladies about preventing prolapse because that's the time where they can do a lot to prevent it. So things like weight reduction, um, bowel health and avoiding um, things like heavy lifting and occupational adjustment um, can really, really help your younger women avoid having a prolapse in the future. Um, in terms of first line management, conservative management, if they're not having many symptoms and they think they can just live with it. Um, another thing you can do is offer them a pessary, which is just a rubber silicon ring that goes inside the vagina and holds everything in place. Um, in terms of surgical, you can do fixation, so a sarcoplexy or plication, um, anterior or posterior, um, and a lifts caldoplasty, um, which is basically where they close the vaginal cavity because the prolapse is so severe that they can't do anything else except for close it off and hope that it keeps closed. Questions on prolapse? Yeah, there is. So again, something that you should be talking to your pregnant ladies about um, after they have their baby. Pelvic floor training is really, really important. Um, that should be every every woman who's had a baby should be doing that. Um, but you know, those greater at risk, such as those who have had um, tears or um, needed extensive management for shoulders dystocia or big babies, things like that. Um, they should be talked about even more and kind of really drummed into them that they should be doing their pelvic floor exercises. 
Um, so incontinence um, is the main part of urogyne that I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, so you've got your stress incontinence. So this is when the raised intra-abdominal pressure causes incontinence. Um, so coughing, sneezing, laughing, physical exertion. Um, and basically, this is the reason that they get it. So normally, the, um, the fascia will close and push down when you have in raised intra-abdominal pressure. When they have incontinence, um, the pressure isn't enough and the, the urethra kind of slides to the side and remains open. Um, and that's done by elevator and I mainly. In terms of etiology, um, a lot of these women are postmenopausal. Um, they've got, had a lot of babies, had maybe a few traumatic births, forceps, um, shoulders dystocia, things like that. Um, they are heavier ladies and um, they might have had a lot of heavy lifting in terms of their occupation. Um, so common presentations, they'll say, you know, I get a bit of leakage when I cough, when I sneeze, when I have sex, when I laugh. Um, things like that. Um, they should have no prolapse features either, and um, they may or may not have some bowel incontinence. In terms of urge incontinence, so these are your overactive bladder and your urinary urgency urinary incontinence. Um, these, I guess, could, you could kind of put uh, stress incontinence is anatomical. Uh, um, this is kind of more nerve-y um, caused by problems with your nerves. So a lot of them will be idiopathic. Um, some can be because they've had a stroke, MS, um, other neurological things. Um, the current UTIs can also cause this kind of incontinence, um, especially if they haven't had them treated um, often. Um, diabetes can be another cause and um, overuse of diuretics as well. So common presentations, um, I wasn't able to make it to the toilet. Um, I wet myself in public, things like that. They won't go out often because they're too, so they're so scared that they'll um, have an accident in public. Um, a lot of them will go to the toilet multiple times a day and they'll start training themselves to go every hour because they think if they don't go every hour, then you know they're gonna have an accident. Um, they'll have um, nocturia, they will also have um, they also will have no prolapse features um, and maybe some bowel incontinence as well. Um, so investigations and management for this. So investigations, um, so you've got your cough, cough stress test and your modified Oxford score. Um, and basically it's one to five. Um, and this, you do with um, when you're doing a vaginal examination, um, you ask them to bear down and like squeeze your fingers. So um, if they don't do anything, it's nothing, um, it's zero. If there's a bit of a flicker, it's one. As you can see, five is normal. Um, other things you can do is a post void bladder scan to see how much is left in the bladder. Um, bladder diaries, <laughs> they love bladder diaries. Um, so whenever you can just say, oh, can you do a bladder diary for us? Because that would be really helpful to see how much you drank and when you went to the toilet and when you had a little accident um, and how much that accident um, caused you to stress, um, how many times a day you had to change your pad or your underwear, things like that. They love bladder diaries. Um, another thing to do is a urodynamic study. These are actually really, really, really uncomfortable studies. Um, it's really, just not really, really unpleasant for the lady. Basically, you get them to drink a whole lot of water. You get them to sit on the toilet and go to the toilet. Then um, you do a trans um, a post viral bladder scan, and then you fill up their bladder again. Um, all the while, they're on the toilet, and you just wait for them to like un be unable to hold it any longer, and then they go again. Um, this is all the while while you're in the room, while the technicians in the room, and they're naked from the waist down. It's, it's really, really uncomfortable and everyone hates it. I wouldn't suggest it unless you really need to figure out which kind of incontinence it is or if it's a mixed picture. Um, and those are the things that you can um, get from a urodynamic study. In terms of management, so 
again, lifestyle things that you can do. So restrict their fluid intake to 1.5 litres a day um, and nothing after about 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. is what we suggest for people with significant nocturia. Um, in terms of coffee and tea, none, if they can have none. Um, but one a day is also okay. And again, the same for alcohol. If they can cut out alcohol in their life altogether, it would be better than having um, any. But, you know, if they want one on a weekend, that's also fine. Just, you know, let them know that their symptoms might, might be worse. Um, in terms of um, specifically for stress and continence, so pelvic floor exercises for at least six months before they give up. Um, a lot of these women will say, oh, you know, I went to the physio, but they went to the physio like twice and they didn't keep doing the pelvic floor exercises and therefore it's not helping. So, you know, you need to tell them, like, you need to tell them that it's going to take six months to 12 months for this to have any effect on your incontinence, but just stick with it. It will help. Um, other things, surgical things you can do are like a mid urethral sling. So a mesh to stabilize the urethra. Um, these will have 80% success rate. Some people will have it recurrent. Yep. Um, for the rest of their life would be better. Um, you know, like any muscle as if you stop doing your exercise, your muscles going to degenerate. So, um, you know, you tell them, you know, basically you're bodybuilding your pelvic floor muscles and you need to be Arnold Schwarzenegger um, for it to help. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so they have an 80% success rate for the mid urethral sling. Um, and this, um, can, it can also cause um, retention. So your slinger needs to be just right. Um, in terms of urge incontinence, um, so bladder training with the physio. So like I said, a lot of them do start going every hour and then their bladder gets used to them having to go every hour. So you send them to the physio and they'll get them to start like having longer and longer and longer periods of time between going to the toilet. Um, medications, so oxybutynin can help um, either orally or transdermally um, or any other low dose anticholinergic. But if one of them doesn't work, the rest are unlikely to work. Um, and basically with urgent incontinence, you just reduce the risk factors. So things like medications, like diuretics, if you can get rid of them, get rid of them. Optimize the diabetes because that can cause problems. Um, and then caffeine and UTIs again. Um, urgent incontinence is also where you can use Botox, but again, doesn't work very well at all. Um, any questions and that was it. That's my email. If you guys want to shoot me separate questions and things like that, happy to answer. Um, I'm here all rotation six, so keep me entertained, guys. Thank you so much.